So apparently there's an eclipse coming across North America here in April. There are three big theories surrounding the solar eclipse, which will go across 13 states, and it will last for four and a half minutes. And all of this will happen in a matter of days on April the 8th. Total solar eclipse. Total solar eclipse. On April 8th. On Monday, April 8th. This could be one of the biggest events of the decade on April 8th. There is a solar eclipse that is coming to the United States of America. This is an experience beyond all experiences. You can't prepare yourself properly for what this is like. This is a little bit different. Why is that? Because it goes over seven cities in the United States that have the same name. What is it? It is the name? Nineveh. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you, friends. Now, what I want to do is... From here on out, look at a sermon preached by Charles Spurgeon on March 14th, 1858. That was the year I was born, 100 years before. Uh, just a day before the eclipse of March 15, uh, 1858, that tracked, so, well, right smack dab over England. The duration was just under a minute. Now, Pastor Spurgeon's sermon is entitled, uh, Solar Eclipse. And his tiny text is the first part of Isaiah 45, verse 7. I form light and create darkness. And I will be commenting on a few excerpts from this sermon. This is how it begins. We are all experiencing tomorrow to witness one of the greatest sights in the universe, the annual eclipse of the sun. It is possible that many of us shall have gone the way of all flesh before such a sight shall again be seen in this country, and we are therefore looking for it with some degree of expectation. Uh, unquote. Now, that seems very reasonable, as eclipses so often happen over water and no one sees them. And then there's this. <clears throat> so this is a national word. And whenever God speaks through the sun, through these eclipses, he's always talking to a nation. Okay, so it's like when God wants to speak a national word and get, get their attention in the heavens, he uses the sun to do that. Um, so which nation would that be? Would it be Mexico? Uh, would it be the U.S. or Canada? Okay, back to Spurgeon. Quote, Surely I need offer no apology whatsoever if religion comes forward today and asks that attention should be drawn to her rather than by the eclipse itself. Without a doubt, if there be sermons in stones, there must be a great sermon in the sun. And if there be books in the running brooks, I believe Spurgeon is quoting Shakespeare there, no doubt there is a, many a huge volume to be found in a sun-suffering eclipse. All things teach us if we have but a mind to learn. There is nothing which we can see or hear or feel which may not be the channels of great instruction to us. Let us see whether this may not lead us this morning into a train of thought which may, under God's blessing, be something far better to us than seeing an eclipse. And then there's this. <clears throat> now, I want to just go to Revelation because we're seeing all these different symbols, right? Mm -hmm. And signs in the heavens. But I know in Revelation chapter 6, it specifically talks about some of these signs that we're supposed to look for. Now, I'll spare you my opinion of the sixth chapter of Revelation for now. Spurgeon thankfully goes in a different direction than torturing the book of Revelation. He goes on to say, quote, First of all, eclipses are a part of God's plan. In the olden times, the ignorant people in England were frightened at an eclipse. They could not understand what it meant. They were quite sure that there was about to be a war or a famine or a terrible fire. They were absolutely certain that something fearful would happen, for they regarded it as being a prophecy of coming ills. I mean, that sounds a lot like the fringe evangelical element in America in 2024. He goes on to say, Now, beloved, all that, uh, all that understand anything of God's works know very well that eclipses are as much a part of nature's laws as the regular sunshine. 
that an eclipse is no deviation from God's plan, but that it is a necessary consequence of the natural motion, and I might gloss uh, at the extreme precision, okay, of the moon and the earth around the sun and each other, that there um, should be at some stated periods eclipses. And when we see the eclipse tomorrow, we shall not look upon it as a miracle or anything out of the ordinary, uh, out of the ordinary course of God's providence, but we shall say it was a necessary, um, well, it was, it was involved in the very plan whereby God governs the earth. And then there's this. So we have, uh, just as you were saying, Amos 3, 7, but he reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. That's so correct. you're telling me that we should be looking for signs, but not only signs, but dreams, people that have dreams and uh, depictions of these events too, to correspond. To help us to be able to understand what these signs are saying, because this is what the prophecy back in Acts uh, chapter 2 says, mm -hmm. that he's going to pour out his flesh, uh, his spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and that there's going to be signs in the heavens. And so this is all connected. Okay, now, uh, Spurgeon just alluded to a critical theological truth. It's called providence. God governs what he has created. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. They tell us that Jesus, the incarnate Son, second person of the Trinity, created and sustains all things. We read there, for by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You see, the triune God is sovereign over all things, big and small. Matthew 10, verse 29 and 30. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of much more value than many sparrows. All right. Spurgeon continues, quote, And now, beloved, I have only said these things to draw your attention to other eclipses. There are certain eclipses which happen in God's providence as well as in God's grace. As in nature, eclipses uh, are, are part of God's plan and is, in fact, involved with it. So we believe that in providence, the eclipse shall sometimes overshadow the earth. I mean, the adversaries, the wars, the famines, which sometimes fall on the human race, are but part of God's divine plan of governing the earth and have some beneficial object in their falling upon us. Now, that raises a question, does it not? How can objectively bad things like wars and famines be in any way beneficial? Spurgeon continues, quote, Beloved, believe me, it is God's providence when his paths drop fatness, when the valleys rejoice on every side. It is part of his plan when the fields are covered with corn and when there is grass for the cattle. But it is equally as much a part of the plan of his providence to reduce the earth to famine and bring the human race to misery at certain stated seasons when he sees that an eclipse is absolutely necessary for their good. I believe right here that he is referring to an eclipse of God's common grace in which the rain falls on the evil and the good. And then there's this. <clears throat> but what I am believing is something is going to happen in the prophetic realm because anytime that you see solar eclipses like this, anytime you see these kind of patterns happening. These kinds of patterns in prophetic realms. Mm. Spurgeon continues this way, quote, It is just the same with you in your own private concerns. There is a God of providence to you. Lo, these many years he has fed you. And he has never denied you the supply of your wants. Bread has been given to you, and your water has been sure. Your children have been about you. But now a dark cloud has fallen upon you. The sunlight of God's providence has set while it was still yet noon. While you were rejoicing in the brightness of your light, on a sudden uh, midday, 
midnight has fallen upon you, to your horror and dismay. You are made to say, from where does all this evil come upon me? Well, this is also sent from God. Most assuredly, it is. Your poverty, your sickness, your bereavement, all these things are as much ordained for you and settled in the path of providence as your wealth, your comfort, and your joy. Think not that God has changed it. It involves no change of the sun when an eclipse overshadows it. And boy, do I feel the weight of that statement over the past two years in my own life. I mean, this makes me think of some lines in that old hymn, God Moves in Mysterious Ways. It goes like this, judge not, by the, judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. And then there's this. <clears throat> So God uses the heavens as a supernatural timepiece to show us what we ought to do. It's always been like that, and uh, the church is just now catching up with it, and I'm very, very grateful for it. You know, where do these guys come up with this stuff? uh, Spurgeon continues, quote, Christians, if you will just remember what I'm about to say, you will learn a useful lesson. What is that which will hide the sun from us tomorrow? It is the ungrateful moon. She has borrowed all her light from the sun month after month. She would be a black blot if the sun did not shine upon her. And now, see, all the return she makes is she goes impudently before his face and prevents his light from shining upon us. Do you know anything like that at all in your own life or history? Have you not a great many comforts which you enjoy upon the earth that are just like the moon? They borrow all their light from the sun. They would be no comforts to you unless God shone them and they reflected back the light of his countenance. What is your husband, your wife? What are your children, your friends, your house, your home? What are all these things but moons that borrow their light from the sun? How ungrateful is it when we let our comforts get before our God? No wonder that we get an eclipse when we put these things that God gave us to be our comforts into God's own throne and make them our idols. And then there's this. The church, however, even though we're late bloomers to this revelation, we have finally come into agreement that God does speak through the sun and the moon and the stars, as Jesus prophesied in Luke chapter 21, that he would. And we're actually starting to see that these kinds of messages, you cannot deny them and you cannot ignore them. So you need to know what it is. Okay, I'll agree with that. God does speak through the sun, moon, and stars, and even eclipses. We can go to Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaim his handiwork. You know, all creation speaks that there is a God. It doesn't tell you how you can get saved, that is creation, but it does speak of the handiwork of God. But I don't think that is what this guy means at all. All right, Spurgeon continues, quote, And now, last of all, A total eclipse is one of the most terrific and grand sights that will ever be seen. We shall not see the eclipse here in all its majestic terror, but when the eclipse of the sun is total, it is sublime, like some people in America will see on Monday. He says, but if the sun tomorrow actually did die out and never shine anymore, what a fearful world this would be to live in. And then the thought strikes me. Are there not some men, are there not some here, who will one day have a total eclipse of all their comforts? Thank God, whatever eclipse happens to a Christian, it is never a total eclipse. There is always the ring of comfort left. There is always a crescent of love and mercy to shine upon him. Spurgeon then ends with these amazingly gospel-drenched words, and I quote, My fellow sinner, Have you today any hope that when death shall come upon you, you shall be found in Christ? If you have none, beware and tremble. If you have any hope, take care. It is a good hope through grace. If you have no hope, 
but are seeking it. Hear me while I tell you the way of salvation. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became man. He lived in this world, he suffered, and he died. And the object of his death was this, that all who believe may be saved. What you are required to believe is simply this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do you feel that you are a sinner? If so, he came to save you. All you have to do, and that grace makes you do, is to believe that he came to save sinners and therefore came to save you. Mark this well. He did not come to save all. He came to save sinners. All men who can claim the title of sinner, Christ came to save. If you are too good to be a sinner, then you have no part in this matter. If you are too proud to confess that you are a sinner, then this has nothing to do with you. But if with a humble heart and a penitential lip, you can say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner, then Christ was punished for your sins, and you cannot be punished for them. Christ has died instead of you. Believe on him, and you may go your way rejoicing that you are saved now and shall be saved eternally. May God the Holy Spirit first teach you that you are a sinner and then lead you to believe that Christ died for sinners, and then apply the promise so that you may see that he died for you, and that done, you may rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And your sun shall never set in an eclipse, but shall set on earth to rise with tenfold splendor in the upper sphere, where it shall never know a cloud, a setting, or an eclipse." You know, friends, this sermon is so well worth hearing in its entirety. So I will put a link to it in, uh, well, in the info section uh, that, uh, that's below, okay? And listen to it. Listen to this whole sermon, if you, if you would, uh, before the eclipse on Monday happens, if you possibly can. Oh, and one more thing. All this talk about the towns of Nineveh and Jonah and even rapture being signs, Well, Jesus did speak about the sign of Jonah. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus was pointing to his death and glorious resurrection. So enjoy the eclipse on Monday if you happen to be able to see it. Protect your eyes from the blinding brightness of the sun. They're the only pair that you have. And come what may in this life, place all your blue chips on the person and work of Jesus Christ to save you from your sin and believe the promise that he will bring you ultimately in both body and soul to eternal glory in his presence at his second coming when he ushers in, in fullness, the new heavens and the new earth.